recording. So we are here with Matt Cox, and this is the very first podcast for Rewiring Everett, which means that if you screw this up, it's all your fault. So this is all going to depend on you. So on Matt you? and I, no, it's going to depend <laughs> on you because there's no way it's going to be my fault if this whole thing crumbles down. So if this interview goes bad, yeah, we're going to have to pull the plug. Well, so a lot fine. of pressure on you. A lot of pressure. So you and I spoke, uh, gosh, five, six months ago um, on an article, but I want to go back and I want to give you some time to do a real quick uh, overview of Matt Cox. Um, do your, your 15 minute overview of, of your life. 15 minutes? Or 20. Or no, I can, seven or, days. I can do a quick overview. I got a five minute overview. Do a 10 minute, do a 10 minute one. I mean, the 10 minute one, uh, let's see. Um, my name is, you know, Matt Cox. Um, basically, I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm a con man. You know, I, I grew up in Tampa. I owned a mortgage company. I'm essentially, I, I don't know. I'm, I am not responsible for, I don't know if I'm responsible for this, but the government has attributed me to having built financial institutions out of anywhere between, uh, I would say $15 million to $55 million, but that's an exaggeration on their part. I never, I, I've never seen $55 million. So, uh, you know, it, um, so basically I own a mortgage company and, in Tampa in the, uh, in the early 2000s. And we, my mortgage company committed uh, mortgage fraud, a considerable amount of mortgage fraud. And uh, at some point I ended up on probation, lost the mortgage company. Then I went on to uh, you know, instead of doing the right thing and just claiming bankruptcy and starting over another industry, I just continued to commit fraud and I sold like 11 and a half million at that point. Then I went on the run. The FBI shows up to come and arrest me at some point. I went on the run. I was on the run for three years. I was on the uh, Secret Service's most wanted list. I was on the FBI's most wanted list. I was number one on the Secret Service's most wanted list. Uh, let's see, the U.S. Marshals were looking for me, uh, secret service, FBI. I continued to commit fraud. I, I defrauded the banks out of an additional three and a half million dollars while on, while on the run. And, uh, eventually I got caught and I received 26 years in federal prison. I ended up doing 12 and a half years. And, uh, I was released about a year ago. Uh, you know, I've had like 26 or 27 IDs, driver's licenses in seven different states. I've made, I've counterfeited another probably 20 or so, stolen over 50 identities, according to government. Had a couple, well, a couple dozen. Yeah, I've had a couple dozen passports uh, issued by the State Department and other people's names. I have, you know, I've been caught multiple times by banks talked my way out of it, caught by law enforcement, handcuffed, taken to police stations, talked my way out of it. And uh, anyway, uh, went to prison. I cooperated, got my sentence taken down from 26 years to 12 years. Um, I write true crime stories now at this time. I, I'm a true crime writer. I also paint and I do podcast periodically. I, I have a book, uh, a memoir, several uh, true crime books that are out. Um, yeah, right. Nice. Me. Um, what else? Uh, I, you know, that's, I, I mean, uh, without getting into specifics, that's, you know, that's um, pretty much I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, unless I were to get into specifics. That's yeah, fine. and and you know, all that's fascinating stuff. And and um, we all have that part where we just love the the story, the 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 how how I came to connect with you is I broke my wrist, 
And I had to sit on the couch for hours. And I think I watched 12 hours of your podcast. I mean, because that story is, I mean, it's just riveting. But that's not why I sought you out. I sought you out because when you were talking about, um, and I'm not going to use her name because when I interviewed her, she said she changed her name. So I'm not going to use this, right. this person's name. So this person turned, when you, when you were in this, in this life, this person turned herself in and went to prison because she turned herself in because she was involved in, in, in one of these crimes with you. And very casually, you said, oh, yeah, I talked to her. Once I got out, I talked to her every day. So yeah. you're a con man. I didn't, I didn't know whether that was real. I reached out to you and you said, oh yeah, not only do I talk to this person, but I talk to these people and I talked to this guy that was on my indictment and I talked to this guy that, that uh, that's the part I want to drill into because I think your, your crime story is fascinating. And I, and I, I read the book and I, but I think you might hold the secret sauce to people like me. I think you might have part of this and I don't know if it's, it's a side effect. You, you called yourself a narcissist before. I don't know if it's a side effect of that because most of us wouldn't have the guts to even reach out to these people. So my, I guess my first question is, do you, I know you have regret. Do you have remorse? Do you have the, the way that normal people do? Because I'm, I'm seeing you, you, you have like this, this crime superpower when it comes to this stuff. Um. <laughs> the crime superpower? I don't I, know what that. I, I think you might. All right, here's a perfect example. So I'll give you three. I'll give you three criminals, and I used this example when we talked last time. Frank Abagnale, catch me if you can, right? Uh, right. Jordan Belforth and and Matt Cox. So Frank right. Abagnale, con man, did all this all this stuff. Forty years later, he's still remorseful. Forty years later, when he talks about it, he's still regretful. He's just he's embarrassed by all he did. Jordan Belfort, the uh, the guy from um, Wolf of Wall Street. This is one cocky guy. He has I've seen him walk off interviews. I've seen him be sort of sort of cornered, and and he'll walk off. He's 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 very arrogant. He's very. It doesn't seem like he has any remorse. And then you're right in the middle. How do you compare yourself to these two guys, and why are you able to do what they can't? Um, I don't know about as far as, I mean, as far as I, I, the, I think the question one remorseful, I mean, obviously if I could go back and make different decisions, I would, but you, know, you don't I don't carry know, it. It's not a burden for you. Right? It doesn't bother me. It, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't, I don't, I don't constantly feel horrible about anything that I did. But most people who leave prison do. do you think? Um, no, no, I think no. most people that go to prison are sociopaths. Uh, they're, you know, anti, they, have, they suffer from, you know, uh, they're antisocial. And, uh, and I don't think they have any remorse. I think if they, if you're a con man and you go to prison, then while, and I've met dozens of these guys, and I would say every single one of them, by the way, not, I can't, I can't sit here and say, well, no, there was that one guy. Nope, every one of them, while incarcerated, all they were thinking about was, how do I hide from this? Can I change my name? There's a company called uh, reputation.com. Um, I can hire them to get rid of all the stuff on the internet. How can I re-enter the business? How can I, like, they're, they're not thinking, none of them are thinking about taking responsibility. You, you, know, you didn't meet one person in prison that was full of remorse and full of regret and, and, and when everyone was a burden. Yes. No, no. I'm going to specifically con men. Okay. Now, All right. Listen, there's lots of guys that are in there like they, they can't, they're remorseful because they lost it. Their kids don't talk to them anymore. Their, right. their fam, wife's divor wife divorced them. You know, there's all kinds of things that went wrong. And so they feel horrible what they did, you know, oh, if I'd only known and this and that. And there, there's, there are those guys. There's not a ton of them, but there are those guys. Um, but I would say specifically out of con men, uh, you know, most of them are either denying their con men at all. Oh, it's not what it sounds like. They twisted it. They, well, then why'd you take a plea for 10 years? Why didn't you go to prison? I mean, why didn't you go to trial? Or right. they went to trial and then you know you you end up reading their transcripts or you, you read an article on them or something and you realize 
it was, you know, <laughs> it was a misunderstanding. You were using a different name. Money went into your bank account. You were spending the money on your own, on your car and buying houses and this. You never invested in what you borrowed, the, got the money from the, your investors for. You know, it's a fraud. Just, oh, you don't understand. No, I understand fraud. You're committing fraud. They just don't want to own up to it. They're so used to a life of just denial. And mo not and, most and is that them. something that builds up or is it just something in you? You have to have this in your DNA in order to be a good con man. Or is it sure, just something? I, I, I possibly. Or maybe you're just a good salesperson that something in your childhood went wrong. But I'm saying these guys, I'm going to say typically, but uh, to me, I've never met a guy that was like, wanted to get out and really do the right thing or own up to it. It was always about, and if they did, they wanted to spin it somehow. Hmm. Instead of just saying, I went to prison, I, I, or, you know, I, I screwed up. Here's what I did. I did this and this and this, and this is what happened. And that's the way it is. And, you know, and, and I'm going to move on and I'm not going to hide from it. I'm not going to not tell anybody to me. If the opportunity presents itself where you can own up to it and tell someone and you don't, you're hiding it. Mm -hmm. If you, if someone if you're at a, having a conversation with somebody and they say, Oh, so what do you do for a living? And Oh, so how long have you been doing that? Oh, you just, how long have you lived here in Tampa? Oh, how, and you keep giving these evasive, like, Oh, you know, uh, Oh, I, I grew I was born here. You know, you can answer those questions or, or, Oh yeah, I, I used to own, I used to be in real estate. Now I, I write true crime. I've always liked it. You can always, you can answer questions without lying but you're still being dece dece uh, deceitful. Right. To me, the moment somebody says anything, I immediately say, oh, I just got out of federal prison. I, you know, oh, I was in federal prison for this and this and this. I immediately start to tell them everything right then. Mm. Because otherwise you're, you're, you're avoiding it and you're being deceitful and you, you know damn well what they're asking. Don't, don't, don't try and be a, don't try yeah. and be cute. And, and most of these guys that are in prison, that are con men, are trying to get out of prison and cover up what they did so that they can really just get into a position to commit another fraud or another, another crime. All right. So let me spin this on you a little bit. So we're using this example of, of, of going to prison, but there are people out there every day that have done something that they're, they're, they're just grief stricken about. How do we take that? I mean, are, are, is, are you saying from your perspective that if, that if I did this horrible thing and I don't admit it when I have a chance, I'm running from it? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why, what, I mean, if you've done something and the opportunity presents itself where you could actually own up to it right then, how sorry really, I'm not saying you have to say, hey, when I was you know, 19 years old, 30 years ago, I, you know, robbed the convenience store and I was never caught for it. And I was, I'm not talking about something along those lines. I mean, I'm saying that if it's a question that is basically you understand what they're going for and you were to, you start, avo use, you start avoiding that, answering that question, then I mean, how sorry are you yeah. for for it does, does that make sense i mean yeah how... yeah yeah so so if you are if you're at a cocktail party and you and and you're talking about your your marriage you're you're married for 15 years but there was a year that you were separated because you cheated on your wife if you're truly sorry in this definition you will mention that to the person well if they said oh so you're happily married oh how long so you guys have been together for 15 years uh, oh you've been happily married for 15 years so well i wouldn't say happily i'd say look right. there was a time you don't have to sit there you don't have to embarrass your wife right 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 i think but you said there was a time i actually we actually almost got divorced we i moved out for about a year i moved back in i mean you know things happen you don't have to you know because to me you, now i'm embarrassing my wife i don't want to embarrass my wife. no but i but, think that's a I, that's an important point i think that's a really so, important point yeah if, if if you have something that you are really sorry about and th th this is the gospel according to matt cox uh and you have the chance to own up with, up to it and you don't then you are not sorry yeah i, I think you're just avoiding yeah. it i mean look, look listen what why look the, the, here's the way 
the way I, I see it is like, for instance, it's like this. It's, uh, there's a lot of guys in prison that cooperate with the, the government. Okay. You know, they're, they're snitches, they're rats, right? They're cooperating, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, they're CIs, whatever, however you want to say, it. you can say it nice and whatever. But the fact is, is that they'll do it and then they'll deny it the rest of their life. Mm. And, and, you know, I go on podcasts and I say, this is what I did. I cooperated. I did this. I did this. I did this. And if you have a problem with it, you know, tough, tough. I mean, I don't know if I can cuss. I don't think you want me to cuss, but I'm saying whatever you, whatever you want. Yeah. Then go fuck yourself. Right. If you have a problem with it, that's your fucking problem. But for me to sit here and deny it and try and spin it and lie about it, I feel like you give up that right when you cooperate. Mm. So if I'm going to sit here and say that I was in a business relationship with someone and when it came down to it, I screwed this person over. I kept $50,000 and I knew there was nothing they could do. And I just stopped answering their phone calls. And then 10 years later, I see the guy and I said, man, I'm so sorry about that. And I feel so bad. And I, this, and I, that, and I, you know, wish I hadn't done that. And I, this, and, you know, and, and I can't really make it up to you or, or for whatever reason, you know, you, you don't have the money or maybe you do have the money. You're just not going to pay him. Instead, you know, what most people do, most people do the whole, well, you don't understand right. what happened. Right. This guy one time did this and this, or even if they said they were sorry, so you say you're sorry, but the next opportunity you have and where you're friends with somebody else, you avoid that discussion where, where you're friends with a mutual friend. You avoid the discussion about what happened 10 years ago or five years, whatever it was. You spin it, you avoid it, you try not to own up to it, you try to, then you're not sorry. You're not really sorry. It was convenient, it's a scam, you're lying. To me, I would say, yeah, you know that thing with Jimmy? Yeah, you know, I saw him the other day. I said this and this and this. Oh, okay, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really fucked up. You know, I really did. And I'm not in a financial place where I can really make it right for him. You know, I talked to him about it. I, I explained the situation. It, it, it was absolutely my fault. You know, but once again, you had a friend that's a mutual friend that knew the situation and you just avoided it. So you're not really sorry. First of all, if that guy, that guy probably already made his mind up, right? Whether you did it or not, or whether you were responsible, you've been lying this whole time and you decide to come clean, then come clean. I'm not saying you have to pay the guy back. It's been 15 years. You can do what you want to do. But if you're going to own up to it, or if you've been lying about a situation, telling everybody, this is what really happened, but you know what? You know, that's not what really happened. Mm. And one day you decide, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a scumbag anymore. I'm just going to start being honest about everything from here on out. Because that helps you be a more honest person, doesn't it? What, what happens? What happens when you do that? I mean, were you, was there a time when you were that guy angry and screaming and saying, I was not on my fault or, or it wasn't me. Yeah. Not what you think. Did you, did you go it. through that, that time period? Yeah, I, I think there's been, a, there's been a time when I would try and justify every single thing I did. So you could see a difference between when you finally said, yeah, I did it, and it's, you saw a difference well, I, in, in the burden that you carried. I think I'm a thousand times happier. Yeah. You know, and I just, you know, I don't, I go into a situation and I, I've, listen, I've gone into situations and where, People have been like, you know, hey, you might not want to, if this comes up, don't mention it, you know, that you get out of prison, you this, I'm like, oh, well, then I shouldn't go. No, no, <laughs> just don't say anything because they, well, then I shouldn't go. Like, because if it comes up, I'm going to mention it. Because if someone no. asks, I'm going to mention it. Because, because now you're asking me to go in there and be deceitful. If I'm going to be deceitful, I'm not going to do it for my pride or for your pride because you have a friend that's a felon. If you have a friend that's a felon that you don't want anybody to know is a felon, then don't have a friend as a felon, you know, or don't hang around with people that give a shit mm. that you have friends that are, oh, well, you've got that friend. I don't know about hanging out with you. Well, then I shouldn't be hanging out with you or I shouldn't be hanging out with them. I mean, I got to make a choice, you know? I, I just, I just don't, I don't understand that. I, and I just don't have the time or patience anymore. Did you see just, a lot of that when you first got out? 
Um, I did, for a, there, were, there were a few people that didn't, that I thought would respond to emails and, you know, like, I don't want anything from you, but I'm trying to rebuild a, um, a uh, shoot, what does my probation officer call it? Um, not a secure, secure, like a, a you know, a safety net, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a group of friends that are good for you. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to kind of rebuild that. And so I'm reaching out to people that I'm thinking are decent people that know me and that would want to, you know, we could go to dinner, we could hang out, we have fixed similar interests and they don't want to talk to me. Mm. Not all of them, but about half of them just don't respond or they, hey, what's up? Yeah, we got to go to, you know, I get the text. We definitely, we got to go to dinner. We got to go to dinner. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I talk to my, uh, you know, my friend and we're going to this and we're that and it just never happens. And but the truth is, is that you don't really want to go to dinner with me. Okay. So, so let me, let me drill into this because this is interesting. So your average person, your average person that would do that, there is an enormous risk to reach out to that person. They're, they're taking all the chips and they're the emotional chips and they're putting them to the middle of the table. They're going, I'm reaching out to this person. I hope that they're positive when they're not, it's a huge hit, but to you, you seem to go, okay, they're not, they're, they're not going to accept me. They're not going to be interested in me. They're kind of blowing me off. They're just being nice. And it doesn't seem to affect you the way that it would affect other people. That, well, that risk of reaching out. I mean, I, I, you know, I think you and I have discussed this before, but I mean, I'm not, I am, and I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe it's learned behavior. I, I'm just, just not concerned about what you think of me. I mean, your opinion of me or someone's opinion of me just it just if this person's saying oh i'm not I, I don't too good to be around this guy or this isn't my kind of guy or this or that I, i'm not offended by it because you know what i'm saying i'm not concerned about your opinion your opinion doesn't mean anything to me i mean you're just someone that i need to hang out with that's probably going to help me in some way and i'm concerned about helping me at this point i'm not and, and if you don't want i don't want to make you feel uncomfortable i don't dislike you if someone's a, a CPA and they've got all lawyers and CPA and doctor friends and they're in the you know upper three percent of society and they're driving a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes and living in a million dollar house and you know and they say hey I don't want to hang out with you I understand that you've built your life you've you don't want to hang out with a guy like me you you know you have a certain impression of me right or wrong and it it, it doesn't bother me I would prefer you just to say it mm -hmm. listen Matt to be honest. You're just not the kind of guy that I really want to hang out with or be in, in my crowd. I wouldn't even be offended. I'd be like, thank God, thank God I didn't spend the, ne the next two weeks having to text you back and forth to arrange a dinner that you don't want, that you, you don't even want to go to. Perfect. I can move on to somebody who, who, who's interested in hanging out with me. So what would your advice be to people that don't have that skill, that want to develop that? Because there's nothing unhealthy about what you just said. I think that's very healthy. And, and so, but if a pot, some of that might be learned, some of that might be in your DNA. What would your advice be to people to develop that skill? Because I think that's a great skill to have. You know, it's funny that, do you ever watch TED Talks? Yes. There's a woman, I'm gonna, I'll send you the link. All right. Uh, and she calls it her, I forget. It, it's like, don't give up. It, she says like, you know, it's her, I don't, uh, basically she's saying, I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's even says, and uh, look, she does it beautifully because her whole thing is like, you think she like hearing that you think that this is a rule or a way of living that gives you the right to be an asshole. And it's absolutely not. And she explains, it's absolutely not. It's just prioritizing. And mm -hmm. she's a, you know, she cusses a little bit in it and everything. But you, when you listen to the whole thing, you'll go, uh, you're just like, wow, it's, it's great. It's great. Um, I'm trying to find her right. Oh, I can't do it. I turned turn off fine. my... You want me to... Say, I'll send it to yeah, you. Yeah, send it to me. And you can put the yeah. link on. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great. She really just explains that, you know, you don't have to be polite to everyone, you know, you, you or lie to them or go to their birthday party. You know, you've got, she uses the example of having somebody at work who's a secretary that she never talks to that's having a party 
you know, that she doesn't even talk to and that, but she's like, but everybody's going to go that I know and it's work and I feel like obligated and this and this, but I really want to watch this TV series. And then she has this whole thing and she's like, then you just tell them no. You say, no, I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I, I can't. And she goes through the whole thing. She's like, and you don't need to feel guilty about that. Right. There's no reason to feel guilty about right. saying I'm prioritizing my time and we're not close enough friends for me to take three hours out of my night when I could be spending that doing something I want to do or be, do that spending time with people that are in my life and would be in my life. You're in my life because it's work. You're a work friend. If we are, I ever get fired or quit, you're gone. You know, these, I, I love those people that think they're such great friends with their hairdresser because they see him twice right. a, a month. And we're, right. so, we're super good friends. Or your you're tax not. guy that you see once right. a year. Right. Yeah, you're, you're not. Just because right. he knows the names of your kids. You know, you, you know it's, just, it's just silliness. And I just don't have time for silliness. And I don't, and, and I'm not concerned about what anybody thinks about me. And, you know, and, and we had talked about, you know, like you, it was like the people that had cooperated against me. Remember we had talked about that one mm -hmm. time and you were saying like, how is it you talk to these people or you're okay with these people that cooperated against you and you're not upset? I mean, most people would be upset. I've even had people that have said things that were just not true, you know? And I look at it and I think that, you know, initially I was upset, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, not saying something is not true, but just cooperating in general is what a decent person does. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's what a lot of criminals do when they're caught. But in general, I'm pleading guilty. I was committing a crime. Someone is cooperating, telling the authorities that I committed the crime. If I'm truly sorry about it, mm -hmm. and I wish I hadn't done it, other than just getting caught, then why would I be upset that that person's cooperating? They're doing the right thing. They're, they're, they're a decent person. They're a good citizen. They're trying to be a good citizen, even if they were a criminal, even if they're doing it to save their own neck. W what does it matter? They're not yeah, and, and I get that, and that makes perfect sense on paper, but we're also people. And how do you not take that that he, he turned me in he defined, how do you not, how do you not go down that path? And I understand what you're saying. It makes perfect sense. But when emotions are involved, you know, things that make sense on paper don't. Well, I think having been through it and realizing kind of like people's true nature after going through it, I think I've re just realized that it was, it was unrealistic of me to have ever thought that these people were going to not cooperate or go to jail or do additional time by not cooperating against me. They have families, they have children and wives and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters that want them out there. And I'm just some guy you met a year or two ago that made you some money. Mm. And yeah, did we go out and have fun and laugh a lot? Sure we did. But but that's that's that really is completely irrelevant. Uh, the people you truly, you know, owe uh, loyalty to is the people that you're leaving behind. I always love the guys that justify stealing or committing crimes or doing something for the sake of their family. Well, I'm doing that to give. I'm doing it to give my family a, a you know more money and take care of them and take really. Because I mean, the truth is your, your son, although he does want a new toy or whatever every once in a while, I think he'd rather have you there. Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's, it's just your wife, you know, yeah, she'd like a nice, nicer vehicle or a bigger house, but you know what? In, in the end, she really just wants you around. And it, it's, it's, you know, I think it's just justification. Yeah. And, and I don't know, look, I, 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 perfectly happy with everybody that was involved in my case that cooperated against me. I, I love to hang out with them, go to dinner and laugh and joke around. And I've talked to many of them and they're always, I even have a guy that I know cooperated against me that he doesn't know that I know because nothing happened during the cooperation. So it never came to fruition. 
but I know that he was actively working with the authorities and I've never said anything to him. Mm. Said anything to him because I don't want to embarrass him. And, you know, he's got a, he has a certain, um, like a reputation and, and he, you know, but, but I know. And I, I don't, you know, it's like, I don't want to say anything. It, you know, he's a nice guy. I, I'm not, ups- I'm not, I'm not upset about it. And right. I honestly don't think I want to mention it because I don't want to hear him deny it. When I have the, I have the, the Freedom of Information Act documents from the authorities. And why would that, you? What, what, what would you gain by doing that? That doesn't. By you know, saying yeah. something? Yeah. No, I wouldn't. But I think a lot of people would. A lot of people that have like a, uh-huh. have that, and they just have the wrong attitude. They, they would want to confront him or say something or make right. him look back. Right. It's just silliness. It's pride. It's just your pride. You know, and, and it's. It's horrible because I, I'm so arrogant and, and, and I'm definitely a narcissist. And, you know, I just think everything I do is just wonderful. Mm. And it's, it's horrible. It's just a constant battle for me, constantly having to stop myself and stop myself from patting, patting myself where, on the back. Where's the line for that? I mean, where's the line between confidence and enthusiasm and gumption and narcissism? Where, where, where's the dividing line? It's if I can feel myself bragging and to be honest with you, if I, if I feel myself kind of bragging about something, I've probably already gone off the charts. Like by the time I realize it, I've already been doing it and it's obnoxious. Okay. And I have to kind of stop myself and go, you know, look, get over yourself, bro. Okay. I can't, I keep reminding myself, you're just some douchebag that got out of prison. Okay. That's all you are. You just got out of prison. And, you know, I have these guys that like admire me because I was on American Greed and Dateline. And there were all these articles and they admire me and they admire me for all the wrong reasons. Right. And, you know, I have guys that send me comments that, you know, I have a YouTube channel mm-hmm. and, and I, I do movie reviews and I do podcasts and things. And guys in the comments will want to contact me to talk to me about a business or what would you, like they're asking me for advice. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just the worst person to ask. Even though I wouldn't volunteer, try and give you bad advice. What do you, clearly you're making a bad decision. You don't reach out to me for advice. Right. I mean, I'm not saying it'd be bad advice, but there's gotta be other people. Um. I, I, but how does that not fuel your narcissism? I mean, it, what, no, it what, does. What you did in prison, by the way, from a business standpoint, collecting these stories, that's just genius. No, no one could be, I mean, you, you, you had 12 years in prison. You had all the time with these guys. So you sat down and you collected these stories. No reporter in the world is going to get a fraction of that stuff. And now you walked out with this portfolio of stories. Brilliant. But now, as you're as you as you're reaching out and you're exposing yourself, you're 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 finding these people, and they're going to find you, and and they're going to be fanboys. And how does that not make the narcissism go through the roof? I mean, it it it, it does. I'm just constantly I'm constantly fighting it. It's just like a constant struggle, and it seems so silly. But it just, it really is. And, you know, luckily my, the girl I'm dating is just, she just like keeps me on, on an, uh, an even keel. She's, you know, I'll start to get, start to, I'm like, oh, this and this and this and this. And she'll look at me and she'll be like, she'll, she'll go, listen, calm down. Okay. You're not all that. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And then there are other times I'm, you know, I'll wake up and I'm depressed or something. And I'm like, you know, man, this is never going to work. And it's taken so long and that deal fell apart and this happened. And I, uh, it's just, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And she's like, what are you talking about? You're incredible. You're great. You're doing great. You just got out of prison. How fast do you think, you know, so she pulls me back up. Right. She's like trying, she's like trying to keep me here from, instead of going up and down, she's, they're trying, everybody I know is, but you know what, what I think does that? is the fact that everybody knows that I have these issues because I'm so open about it. And, and one of the things that, and I've told everybody the story that knows me, I had a friend of mine named Caesar that was in prison with me. And we were in a, a drug program called RDAP. And Caesar, 
uh, and because we talked about narcissism and, and, you know, everything, you go through this program, it's just an incredible program. And so Caesar would, I would see him and I'd say, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? And he'd go, oh man, I just got off the phone with my wife. And he would start telling me about his, this argument he had with his wife. And then this is what I typically do all the time. The whole time you're talking, I'm just waiting for an opportunity to talk about myself. Mm. Like I'm waiting for an, an, an in. Mm. So he would say something, I'd go, oh man, I remember one time with my wife. Right. I, I did, and he would, he would go, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not done yet. I'm going to be done in a minute. Give me, give me a couple more minutes. And he, and he keep going. Right. And then I go, oh, you know what? That reminds me. And he go, oh, wait a second. He go, listen, I got about five more minutes of talking. Right. And then we're going to get our food. And right. we're going to talk about you for the rest of lunch. Right. But you're going to give me five more minutes. And there have been times when he would be talking, telling me a story. And I would, I mean, I'm the whole time I'm, and he would stop and he'd even stop in the middle of the story in the middle of the story and say, Bro, I want to let you know something. I know it's killing you right now, but you're you're doing great. He didn't even have to say He's what it was. He's encouraging you for not being a jerk. He's like, just, yes. just not be a jerk, just five more minutes longer. Right. right. And and here's the thing, he wasn't doing it. He wasn't doing it to be mean or to be rude or to be a, to, for him to be a jerk or, or to try and make me feel bad. He was doing it because he's a friend of mine and he knew it was a behavior that was wrong and that I wanted to correct in myself. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely unable to do it without help. I mean, it really was, it was it's, it's horrible. To this day, it's horrible. My girlfriend, it, it, my, I have a friend, uh, Stacy. I have all kinds of uh, friends and, and they will, they will do that. They will say, okay, we were, we were talking about, you know, I'll start saying some shit and right, they'll go, right, 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 right. you were talking about me. Right. Let me finish what I'm saying. You, you just, what did they always say? Um, uh, you just hijacked the conversation. Yeah. You're hijacking the conversation. Yep. Let's go back. I was telling you about my friend, Jennifer. Let me finish telling you about Jennifer. Then we can, you can tell me what, and I'm like, and you know, and I don't even, I'm like, fuck, I can't. Yeah can't believe I just did it again. Who wants to be, who wants to be friends with that guy? I wouldn't. Yeah. It's a one-sided relationship. It's a horrible relationship. It's all about me all the time. Well, and, and you can, you can flip that too. I mean, if you want to, if you want to really, if, if, if you want to hate yourself, right, make it all about you, right? Take it, take, take out, take every conversation and hijack it just, just like you thought. Find the people that you feel superior to, hang out with them, find the people that challenge you, keep them as far away as possible. You know, right. all these things. So, so not all, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, yeah, if, if somebody, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm just not interested in surrounding myself by people that let me get away with just bad behavior. And it's got to be hard for the narcissism because you're making a living now talking about you. You're making yeah. a living doing all this stuff. Let me tell you about me. And, and that's part of your, you know, the, the process right now to get your name out there. Well, yes. And, but I'm also talking about the, the subjects that I wrote. Correct. Which, there was a, a woman uh, named um, uh, Rachel Moore who writes for the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, when she did the interview with me, she said, it's funny for someone who's a, you know, who's a narcissist. She was, you picked a career path where you're, you have to sit and show interest in other people's stories and you have to be quiet. She was, and you, you have to show interest and you have to really delve into their stories. But, and I was like, yeah, that, that you know, I, I thought that is odd, but in, for me, it's entertainment. Like if I'm watching a movie, I don't talk during the movie. You know, if I'm talking to these guys, I ask them a question, they just start talking and I'm writing, right? Then I ask another question, and they write, right? I know their lives inside and out by the time I'm done. Right. And so it's funny that, that I've chosen that career path as opposed to, you know, just, you know, I am trying to sell books and I am doing the, the because I'm trying to sell a memoir. Mm hmm um, and a lot of these guys' stories kind of are intertwined with mine in some in some ways. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's no, it's not a challenge or a hardship on me to go on a podcast and talk about myself for three hours. Right. I mean, that's not like these guys are, I, these guys are uh, always this, the, and the guys in the comments are always saying, you know, oh, I hope that guy's paying you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I pay him. Right. I, <laughs> like, you, right. I drove across the, I drove an hour and a half to get here. I drove two hours. Talk about me. You don't have to pay me anything. I'm ready. We we're, get to talk about me for three hours and you have to listen. And then at the end of it, I'm going to get to sell a bunch of books. Sign me up. Yeah. So, so let me, I'm glad you brought this up. So let me, let me run a theory by you. So you are in some way making or, or, or start to make a living on crime, on other people's criminal stories. Because I, because I, there's, my theory is that there's something about you attracted to it. That's why you were good at it. You were good at crime. You were successful at crime. And now you like those criminal stories. So here's my theory slash question. So if you didn't have that, if you didn't interview these people, if you couldn't write these books about them um, and yourself, and you had to work in customer service, would you be thinking about a real crime? Or does this fulfill the need for crime? No, I that's definitely. No, no, you're absolutely, that, this fulfills the need for crime, I think. Okay. It, it takes place of certainly of doing it. You know, you get to hear about it. You get to hear about the, how they got around this or figured this out or who helped them or this. So it definitely helps um, fulfill that need or that desire, or that interest uh, by, by listening to these guys and, and, and writing their stories down. Um, that craving, I guess, you know, because I mean, I think about like people, People will ask me, um, oh, so, you know, you, you ever think about it anymore? You don't, you're totally, I'm like, right. I think about it all the time. Right. I mean, I, I do. I just, I drive down the street and I see some abandoned house or somebody's talking to me. And as soon as they say something, I think, you know, oh my God, I can't believe he just told me that, you know, it, or I'm thinking, oh, wow, you know what you could do? And I'll start to right. go, I start right. to think, no, I should, okay, never, I'm not going to say that. But then I'll sit there and spend an hour on my way home thinking, man, if he did this and did this and then contacted so-and-so and told them this, oh man, that would be, wow, that would be great. You know, I'll start putting it together in my head how the whole scam would work out. And then a lot of times that just, it just gets it out of my system. Uh, so it's a side business where you just do a podcast where you get the glasses and the mustache and the big nose and you make a fake name and you just, you advise on crime. You know what I've thought about doing? This is a thought about doing because I'm doing movie reviews right now. Right. Um, just to get content on the table. And it allows me to kind of just talk and about the movie and the crime. Is this work or that work? This makes sense. This doesn't make right. sense. And I was uh, just interviewed by GQ to do, mm. uh, they might want me to do a, a, a movie review, which would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, oh, I was going to tell you. Uh, oh, but I thought about doing po a podcast. Like I just ordered equipment and stuff so I can do kind of like this. Like right. I just talk and then post it. Um, but I'd like to review um, other people's scams. Like Bernie Madoff. Right. What did he do wrong? Right. Or, you know, Sam Israel. What did he do wrong? What did, um, shoot, what is the guy? Um, is it Christopher... Um, uh, Rowan Court. Anyway, there, there was a, there's another guy who was a scam artist. It was in the late nineties to uh, two thousands. Uh, is it Reckon Court? Reckon Court? Anyway, he's, uh, he was, he was pretty amazing. Um, a friend, he was a, uh, he was from France. He's French and he came over here and he was, he was just conning people out of money and just, mm -hmm. but he did it for, just went on for, I mean, all in New York, uh, LA, um, it, in the uh, um, Long Island, I mean, the, he went to the Hamptons. I mean, he's calling himself Rockefeller. Hmm. You know, he's like he's like Chris Rockefeller, and you know, he'd be like, you know, who I am. And people were like, oh, he's with right. Next thing you know, they're giving him two hundred thousand, a hundred thousand to invest in what he's anyway. But you know, I, I think it'd be interesting to go over other people's scams and where they screwed up. Uh, and, you know, and, and also kind of clarify some things. And there's a lot of 
there's a lot of people that are like, they'll call him, oh, he's a con man. It's like, well, he committed fraud, but he's not really a con man because he ran a legitimate business for 10 years. Something went wrong and it, it's situa it, it's a situational thing, you know, and he got into a situation and it, and so instead of doing the right thing and saying, look, we lost the money in the market, he lie he then lies to his client because he thinks I can make it up. Mm -hmm. I can't tell them the truth. They'll pull their money out. So I'm going to say nothing, let them keep investing and I'll just make the money back. But then it doesn't work out that way. Next thing you know, he's raising money. Next thing you know, he's not even investing the money. He's running a Ponzi scheme. And so everybody's like, oh, he's a con man. He, well, no, he made a mistake. He screwed up. He had gotten to a really bad spot and then he ran with it. He committed a crime, but he's not a, like a con man from the get go or he wouldn't have run it in his own name. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have done it for 10 years. So, you know, I, I think it'd be interesting to go through kind of all these different scams that have happened and what, what they did, how it went wrong. And then you could even expand on it and say, look, if it was really a con, here's how you would set up a real con if you were going to do it. This is, you know, you'd, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you to go do this, but no, if but I were I mean, to do it, this would be exactly how I do it. Right. But stop saying this guy's a con artist when he ran a legitimate place right, for, right, you know, right. for 20 years. And then he had, then he ran a bat, then he ran a, a Ponzi scheme for two years and he went under and, oh, he's a con man. He's been stealing for 17 years. No, he hasn't. You know, so I think, um, I think that'd be kind of, you know, kind mm -hmm. of interesting. I don't think anybody talks about it. I, I guess people don't talk about that for life, maybe for liability. Like they think they're going to get sued or something if they, I don't know, if no, they no. were to say, here's how you would set it up. If you really wanted to run this this type of a scam, you would do this and then this and this, and you'd have this person do this. And then, you know, next thing you know, and then you'd have an exit strategy. None of these guys have exit strategies. They're just going to keep doing it. I mean, yeah, that, you know, that is true. They don't have like a five year plan. These guys just think it's right. going to go forever. I mean, Bernie Madoff, did you really think you were going to yeah. be able to pull this off forever? That's not a con man. Con man has an exit strategy. He's running a con game. He's running a, you know, he's got a, he's following a, a, a plan. He's got an, he, it's not, it's not in his name and he has an escape route. He's yep. got a, he's got an exit strategy, you know? So anyway, I thought that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. There, there's a couple of things that you've, a, a couple of nuggets that I've heard you uh, say before on interviews that were pretty interesting. And, and, the, and one I saw a couple of days ago where you were, it was one of the reviews when you were re reviewing the films. And you stopped and you looked at the camera and you said, you know, I've known guys that own Ferraris and Lamborghinis and they're right. all assholes. They're all, so, so what is there? Is there something about a human being when they buy opulence like that, that, or, 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 or Ferraris just drawn to people that are, that are just ridiculous. I, I mean, it's just, it's so flashy. I just, I can't imagine if I had $20 million, I can't imagine going and buying a Lamborghini. Right. I couldn't imagine getting out. It, it, it just, to me, it just screams, look at me, look at me, look, look at what I have and you don't have. You know, it, it's just, it's such arrogance. And I mean, I, I couldn't do it. And the funny thing is like every guy I've met that has a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or, you know, these 200, 300, $450,000 vehicles. When you spend a little bit of time talking to them, you realize they're just assholes. Really? I mean, it very quickly becomes evident that it's like, oh, you're just kind of a jerk off. Right. You know, like I was hoping to meet you and talk to you. And in the end, you were going to be like this really good guy. Like I know one guy who's had, I think he's had three Lamborghinis. Um, his name is uh, 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 Joseph Vitale. I wrote a story about him. Yep. He's like a super great guy now, you know, and he knows this. He's heard me say this. It's like now I'd hang out with Vitale. He's like a good guy. He went through art. He went to prison. He went through art app. I've watched him cry like a baby about his family and what he's done. And it wasn't like to get through the program. It was like the kind of thing where if you mentioned it to him today, he'd well up thinking about it. Mm -hmm. 
but the person he was when he was buying those things was such a selfish prick. Mm -hmm. And he'll tell you just complete selfishness, didn't care about anybody, didn't. And, and, you know, he would, he would go all into that. And now to this day, I don't, I think if he had $20 million, I don't think he'd buy that car. Mm. I think he'd be more conservative. I think he's got his, his values are, are in the right place. And he's still arrogant, you know, still, still an arrogant guy, but, but more tempered and uh, just a, a genuinely nice guy now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, and even he says it, you know, What's so funny is if you know a guy with a Lamborghini, a Lamborghini and you talk to him and you were to mention this to him, he'd be like, oh, I'm a nice guy. What are you talking about? I right. this, I that. And they probably would never own up to it. But if you asked enough people that kind of know them, they would probably be like, yeah, he's kind of a jerk. He's, he's this, he's that, he's that. But he doesn't know it. Right. You know, you just, you just don't, you don't, you just don't, you don't know it when it's happening. Right. I think I could be wrong. Or maybe he'd say, yeah, I am a complete asshole, but I've got a Lamborghini. Or the, and, and they don't care. I mean, there's some people that are very yeah. successful at that, and they just don't care. That's part of the personality. They're very proud of it. Right. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you right. know, I mean, if that's what you who what you want to who you want to be and what you want, and you want to flash it, and you know, that's mm -hmm. fine. Right. Hey, there's another thing that I've heard you say a couple of times that I'm I'm hoping that you share, and it's your the dental floss story, the story of 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 a day in prison. Can you can you Talk about that quickly. Well, yeah. So prior to prison, I was um, I was on Paxil, uh, which is a, a for a social for anxiety and depression, and uh, I took that. Started taking that when I was in college, and you know it, it's a mood stabilizer. So, so well, I took it for like 10 or 15 years. So by the time I end, I mean, literally when I was on the run and I had a fake ID in somebody else's name, first thing I did was go to the doctor and, pres and get my prescription of Xanax and Paxil. I mean, so every time I change an identity, the next thing I have to do is get a doctor's appointment mm. to go get a new, prescri a new prescription because I can't be driving around with this prescription bottle in somebody else's name, have my car search or something. They, now they, because I'm getting rid of everything. So I got to start over from scratch. I'm constantly getting this thing renewed. But I mean, I did it the whole time. So then I go to prison. And after about a year or two, no, yeah, after about a year in prison, they stopped giving me the Paxil. They had switched providers or something. I forget exactly how they do it. And they said, no, no, we're now giving, well, everybody Wellbutrin. Well, Wellbutrin was, it didn't work for me at all. Then they switched me to some other drug. Then they switched me to Zoloft, which is for like bipolars or something. I was like, are you serious? I mean, it's just, I felt like I was in a haze. I couldn't concentrate. I was just felt groggy. So I got so upset because they kept switching the medication. I eventually just stopped taking it. Mm -hmm. And then the depression really sets in. And, you know, it, you start to realize that in the mornings, it's the worst. I'd wake up and it would be the worst. And throughout the day, it got better. But I started noticing that pattern. And I would, I mean, and I, and so this is the, what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm still this. Right. <laughs> this. I would wake up and I would think, my first thought was, I mean, I woke up in prison, I about 26 years to go. And I'm wake up and I were 24, 25, whatever it was. And I was like, oh. And my first thought was, you know, how much dental floss do I have to buy at commissary in order to weave a rope so that I can hang myself in the bathroom at two o'clock in the morning between guard shifts? Like they had a rail that was up there. You could ask like probably the only place you could do it. Um, and I remember, you know, and I really would lay there and think about that. And then, you know, eventually you start to think that's, that's not. That's not normal behavior. It's not reasonable. What are you thinking? Stop thinking that. It's it's okay. Just get up. You you just get some coffee. So I started doing little baby steps. Mm -hmm. If you can just get some coffee, you can still go to commissary, but get some coffee. So I get some coffee, and then I get the coffee, and I'd be like, okay, coffee. It's good. The coffee's good. Then I get ready, and I think, you know, you got to meet so and so, and I go meet this person, and by ten o'clock, I meet this guy, and where I'm taking notes and it's a little bit better and it's not so bad. And then 
by two o'clock, I'm, I'm eating, I'm eating lunch and I'm hanging out with my buddy, Pete. And I'm like, Pete's a good guy. You like Pete. Pete's nice. Stop thinking about this. It's okay. Then by four o'clock, I start thinking things are good. Things are pretty, things are okay. They're okay. You're okay. It's not a great situation, but you've got some good guys. You've write, you're writing some good stories. You're going to write this guy's story after this guy's. Things are looking up. By six o'clock, I'm like, you got stuff in the court. You're going to get your sentence reduced. Things are good. This is going to be a good experience. Uh, you're, 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 you're lucky. You're lucky to be in this situation. By 10 o'clock, I'm telling myself, you're going to get out of prison. You're going to have all these stories written. You're going to, you're going to take over the world. Everything's amazing. You're lucky. You're going to look back and say, this was a good experience. You're lucky to be here. You're lucky that you, that you did all this and you, you got these stories and that you met these guys. You make some, these are some great guys. You're going to be upset when you leave. This is a great, this is amazing. And I'd fall asleep thinking you're going to get some, some movies made, some series made. This is great. you got great material. And I'd wake up the next morning and I, my first thought was how much dental floss do I have to buy at commissary to weave a rope to kill myself? I mean, it, and this happened, you know, it just it, every day, I mean, it happened every single day, you know, for yeah. a decade, for a little over a decade. That's, that's and, incredible. And, and I still, to this day, I mean, I, when I wake up in the morning, it's just the worst part of the day is waking up in the morning. It, because I don't, I'm not taking anything now. Yeah. Not, you're not at all. No. Wow. No, I, I, you know, I actually went because I kept thinking to myself, I don't want to take a pill every day. Does that make sense? Like, I don't yep. want to be on a depressant, an antidepressant every single day. I don't know what it's doing to my brain. I don't like the, the fact that I shouldn't have to take this. And, you know, and I, I went and tried to get a Xanax because I was having panic attacks when I first got out. Like the whole time I was in prison, 12 and a half years, I think I had two panic attacks and they were minor. When I was on the run and I was running my scams, I was having panic attacks twice a month mm. and they were debilitating. Like me dropping down where walking through a parking lot and sit on the ground really and just couldn't move for like 30 seconds to a minute and then start to be able to breathe and i, I mean i literally thought i was going to die for no reason you're you're you feel like you're going to die and part of your head part of your brain is telling you you're going you're about to be snuffed out god's about to just squish you like a bug and the other part of you is telling you this isn't normal it's just a panic attack and then after about a minute, I would get up and walk back to my car and, and uh, you know, that would be that. And then, so I, I was taking Xanax. So when I got out of prison, I had a several, I've had several panic attacks since I've been out because there's a lot of stress out here mm -hmm. as opposed to being in prison. Um, and I've gone to a couple doctors and they don't want to prescribe Xanax. They don't prescribe it like they used to prescribe it. They've given me other pills and it just doesn't work. The other pills just make me want to go to sleep. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm depressed. I don't have a problem sleeping. Right. Sleeping's not right. my problem. So they try to give me these pills and I've taken them for a week or a few times. And it's just, I'm not, I just don't want to do it. So I'm just going to keep dealing with it the way I'm dealing with it. Good for you. Yeah. And I think what's a, what's an interesting analogy about that is, is it not just prison, but that the highest demographic of suicide today is middle-aged men. I mean, middle-aged men are committing suicide, you know, I think three times what, what that demo, what the, the teenager, you know, their teenage son was just a few decades ago. So uh, I think that's a, that's a powerful, powerful what story. Happen? I, I, I don't wonder. know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it's, if it's financial, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it was a, a an aggressive spike. It's now the, the top demographic of suicides are middle-aged men. Isn't that bizarre? That is, that's, yeah. I mean, luckily I'm not there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, I'm going to close with, uh, with one question. First of all, thanks. That was, I, uh, I always enjoy talking to you. My, uh, uh, I think you've got some insights. Some of this stuff was, was great stuff. Some of the stuff we can, we can copy. Some of it still is the, the Matt Cox secret formula that, that I don't think we can glean from, but you, you gave us a couple of nuggets that I think we can, I think we can change. So 
Um, the whole idea of rewiring came, as I told you, from this novel, 33 Seasons. And 33 yeah. Seasons was about this guy um, named Walker Rowe, who was a, a family guy, white collar guy, goes to prison, um, messes, I mean, very publicly messes up his life, gets out, come back to his, comes back to his hometown and tries to put everything together and be a good father to his daughters. He's the polar opposite of Matt Cox. He is just broken and beaten. And he's just carrying so much guilt. He's going through the paces. Every day is to do things. He gets the newspaper to scan to make sure his name's not in there. Okay, okay, good. My name's not, they did, they're not doing an article on me today. And just that sort of thing. So I want to close with what advice would you give to this character? To, 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 to Walker? Yes. Well, what advice would you give to a guy that got out of prison but can't, but, but, but still carries it? I wonder why, well, I'm, I, I wonder why, I wonder what the thought process is behind what, like, is he looking at the paper and concerned because he's ashamed or embarrassed or is he embarrassed for his daughters? Both. Is he a little bit of both? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, to me, you, I'd, I'd have to just, you know, I look, you've, I, you've heard me say this, that, you know, unfortunately, you know, of course I, it's easy for me to say, you know, it's like going to prison. I used to tell people that if you're married with two kids and you go to prison for two years, you're going to have a harder time in those two years than I'll have in 10. Mm. I didn't have anybody waiting for me. I'm not raising two kids. I don't have a wife. Nobody's waiting. My mom's waiting. That's it. Nobody cares if I come out or if I stay or get out. There's nobody there. There's not a lot of phone calls. There's nobody crying because they're being evicted. There's, no, there's none of that drama. I was lucky. And I know guys that went into prison and immediately broke up with their girlfriends. Mm. What, you know, what, what, you've been dating her three years. Yeah. You're engaged to be married to her. Yeah. You broke up with her. Yeah. But I'm, I got a four year prison sentence. Yeah. But she's saying she'll wait for you. Now nah, I know I, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to be that guy on the phone on Saturday morning saying, why didn't you answer the phone last night? Where were you? But I'm not going to do that. So I'm not, it, she needs to go live her life. She needs to do what she's going to do. If when I get out, she's, a, she's there, we'll see each other again. I mean, I've, I've met these guys. And I, this is when I first went in. I thought that is insane. And I was so desperate, you know, for the outside world. But once you can, if you can, like with me, if you can just let it go, you're going to be at, more at peace. So, you know, for, for that, for this, for Walker, you know, and like I said, and when I got out, my attitude was then and is now, it's only been a year, is that there's, there's only two kinds of people that in my life that I'll allow, you know, or that are out there. And I break everybody up as two groups. There's those people that are 100% acceptant of the person that I was and the person that I currently am. And there are those people that can go fuck themselves. And I got no, I got nothing for you. So the, you know, his problem is obviously he's got two daughters. And so you have to take that into consideration. So you, the only way to get through that to me is you go and you sit down with your daughters and you explain to your daughters, this is what happened. And that there are two kinds of people that are going to be in your lives and my life. And it's those people that are accepting of it and those people that we have nothing for. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, once you break it up like that, and I'm not, I wouldn't be rude to anybody. I mean, I've had people, I've gone out on dates with women that, uh, that brought that as soon as they found out that I just got out of prison, they immediately, what? Oh my God. I mean, they like, they literally almost threw a scene mm -hmm. and I, and I told them, I said, yeah, yeah, let me tell you something. There's two kinds of people. <laughs> and I just told them flat out, you're clearly not accepting of what's going on and what's happening. And I'll never, I'm never going to be that person to deny it or try and spin it or, or do anything. This is what happened. This is the way it is. Deal with it. So to me, he has to have that explanation and, or, or that, that conversation with his daughters. And then he has to live his life like that. 
And, you know, you look, nobody gets the life that they expected, that they wanted, that they deserved, or that they hoped for. Nobody. You, you get the life that, that comes your way or that you make for yourself. Mm. Sometimes it just happens to you. Sometimes you get hit by a car. Sometimes you, you have cancer and you lose a leg. So who knows? But it's the life you have. You do the best with it. And you have to be able to laugh about it. You have to be able to have a sense of humor. I mean, you have to be thankful to even be here. I'm not in prison. Mm -hmm. My out date was 2030. And don't think for one second that the judge and the U.S. prosecutor or the agents were going to lose an ounce of sleep had I spent every single day incarcerated till 2030. They don't care. So... You know, I'm lucky to be here. I'm blessed to be here. And if my name was in the paper tomorrow, as long as the bulk of what they said was true, I'm okay with that. If they said, if they said, hey, this guy's a scumbag, he stole this, he did that, he did this, he this, he this, you know, he once did this and that. And, and it, as long as it, you know, I mean, there's some, they'll put a little bit of a spin on it. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't have phrased it like that, but I didn't write the article. And it's pretty much true. I'm good with that. I'm going to be okay with it. You have to be okay with it. I mean, I can't, you can't live your life dodging things that you've legitimately done. You should have thought about that. Right. When, when I'd be sitting in the chow hall and the guys would be bitching about the food and I'd say, well, you know, when you were robbing those banks and when you, when you kidnapped those five people and zip tied them and went into the vault, in Bank of America, you weren't thinking about what are they going to serve me in prison if I end up in prison. You weren't complaining about the, the, um, about the rice. You weren't thinking about that then. So, you know, you're lucky. You're lucky to be, you're lucky they're giving you food at all. Mm -hmm. Not what I thought it was going to be like. So it's just, listen, you just have to be thankful for, you have to be thankful. And there's, you know, I, I wouldn't, not, I wouldn't run from it. I wouldn't hide from it. I just categorize people and keep moving on. Great, great stuff and a great place to stop. That's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, the memoir of Matt Cox, great book. Um, the site is called Inside True Crime. Yeah, Inside the, True Crime. And then there's a YouTube as well. That's that's also, is that Matt Cox or is that Inside True yeah, Crime? Yeah, it, it's like if you... In, you can put Inside True Crime, it comes up. You can put Matt Cox too. It'll well, Matthew. It's Matthew Cox and Inside True Crime. Any of them, and my website's going to come up. And then we've so. got a bunch of uh, of uh, movies that you've reviewed that are pretty good. I think I'm caught up. I think there's I think there's one that uh, that you just did that I have to get caught up. And then I got to read the book you sent me, so I'm excited about that. So always a pleasure, Matt. This this. You uh, honestly we pulled some nuggets out of here. This was worth doing. I, I really appreciate it. Sure. No, listen, any, any opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> All right. <laughs>